let's close our eyes and bow down our heads and let's look to God in prayer. Yes, Jesus, we thank you that you love us. And we thank you that we read about your love for us in your word that you've given us. But Lord, we also feel your love for us each day of our lives. And so we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, not because we deserve to be loved, but we thank you that you are a gracious, merciful, loving Savior who gave yourself up so that we might live. We thank you for your love that you prove each day for us. Thank you, Lord, that your word doesn't just teach us that you love us, but your word also teaches us how you lived and how you expect us to live. And we pray, dear God, that we wouldn't just read the Bible, but that we would allow the Bible to read us as we apply and as we obey the spiritual truths that we learn. We thank you also, O Heavenly Father, that you have prepared a place for us. That's, your, that's what your word tells us. We thank you for the hope of eternal life that we have. Thank you. Lord, now, as we, as we come to your word, we pray that you would love us still, that you teach us, and that you'd help us to understand you. We thank you for the way you have watched over us individually and watched over this church. Thank you. And Lord, we pray for those who are here with us this morning. We pray for those who have not been able to make it. We pray in a special way for those who are sick, for those who are struggling with different issues, O oh Lord. We ask and pray that you would stretch forth your hands of healing and touch and heal them. In a special way, dear God, we want to pray and come at um, Jake and Dennis into your hands. Both of them underwent surgeries, one planned, one unplanned. But we thank you, dear God, that you are sovereign and that you watched over these, uh, Lord, over uh, the medical care and attention that they received. We ask and pray, dear Lord, that you would grant healing to them and that you'd restore their bodies, O Master. Lord, we pray for ourselves, O God, that you'd work in our hearts too and that you'd draw us to the saving knowledge of Christ. We pray, dear Father, that we wouldn't live in ignorance, that we wouldn't live bound in sin, but that we would experience freedom in Christ. So now, dear Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us from your word. Bless us, for we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. You know, Curtis mentioned that uh, prayer on Wednesday is one of the Wednesdays is one of the one of the most important things that we do here in the church. And so uh, we know that you know with with winter. It may be a little difficult for some of us to come to join here, um, you know, because of the weather. And so, if you'd like to join, um, we will try and use something like Zoom, um, Google Meets. And so, you can join us on video. You can also call in on your phone, and we can all pray together. So, that's something that we hope to start probably from next week on. If you would like to join from your homes, please come and meet me, and then I'll, I'll try to help set you up for that. Christian uh, comedian Brad Stein, he does this, this funny piece about Adam messing up with the animal names. If you remember in, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, God brought every animal and bird to Adam 
and whatever name Adam gave that animal or that bird, that's the name that stuck with it. Okay, and uh, imagine, imagine giving every animal and every bird a creative name. That's difficult, right? Uh, and so Adam, you know, according to, the, according to comedian Brad Stein, what, what he says is Adam gave out all the, the good names right off the bat. You know, he saw this animal and he said, you shall be hippopotamus. You know, big name, 13 letter word, you know, you shall be hippopotamus. Wonderful name. Ten hours later, Adam was burned out. Okay, and he was running out of letters also. And he saw this animal and he said, I don't know, you shall be cow? Cow, I guess? Another one? Just like that one? Uh, yak! Yak! You shall be called yak. And by the time the bugs got in line, Adam was just naming them whatever they were doing. Okay? This insect was buzzing around uh, Adam's face, buzz, and Adam said, fly, fly. Of all the amazing things in the world that fly, that little fly got the name. And the duck was right in front, flapping his wings, going, come on, fly, me. Duck, come on. And that's when God stepped in and he said, I'll take it for you from here, Adam. Thanks anyway. I was, I was going to stop you, you know, after, you, after you, you named that insect grasshopper. But I thought I'll give you another shot. So that's how the animals and the birds got their, got their names. What's in a name? What's in a name? Are names important? You know, on the first Sunday, on my first Sunday over here, I told you the meaning of my, my name, Jit Ish. Now, I don't know how many of you remember that, but that's fine. But my middle name is very Christmassy. Now, some of you may be wondering, my goodness, pronouncing his First Indian name is itself a horror. Now he's going to let us, you know, now we have to remember another name? Don't worry. My middle name is much easier. In fact, it's up there. It's up there. Uh, it's one of the names of, of Jesus. Can anyone guess what my middle name is? Emmanuel. Yes, Emmanuel. God with us. That's what that, that name means. And that's why we, we celebrate Christmas, right? God coming down to be with us. Names are very important. And about 2,000 years ago, a man, a husband, was thinking of quietly divorcing his wife because she had become pregnant before they had any sexual relations. But as he was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will be, will, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, this third Sunday of Advent, we lit that, that third candle, the pink candle, and the third Sunday of Advent is usually called Joy Sunday. It's, it's called Godet Sunday. Godet is, is rejoice in, in Latin. So those are the names 
associated with the third Sunday also. And so now what we'll do is we'll go back to prophet, the, the prophet who mentions this, who gives that name Emmanuel. We'll go back to that prophet Isaiah and we'll see some of the other names of Jesus. Why we need to rejoice because of the name, because of the wonderful names of Jesus. And we're looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This was also read to us in the Advent reading. But let's read that again. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, if you want to learn about the life of Jesus in one verse, it's right there. In the beginning of verse 6, the, the life of Jesus is there in the beginning of verse 6. For to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. There are three pictures of Jesus' life that are given there. And we can see those pictures of Jesus even here, even here today. The name Jesus begins with what is to my left. What's to my left? The manger, right? Yes. The child, for to us a child is born. The name Jesus begins with this, I mean this is a beautiful manger scene. The name Jesus begins here in the manger with him being born there. For to us a child is born. The child Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem. The second picture of Jesus' life is to my right. Now it's not one of these instruments here, but it's to my right way at the back. What do you see there? cross to us a son is given to us a son is given remember John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave he gave his only begotten son so that's the second picture of Jesus to us a son is given and the third picture of Jesus' life is right in front of me. Now some of you may be wondering, what's he talking about? What's this picture? The government shall be upon his shoulder. What's, what's he talking about? Where's the picture of that, of Jesus over there? It's you. It's me. Where should Jesus be governing? Where should Jesus as King, as Lord be reigning today? In you, in me, right? In your life, in my life. And the government shall be on his shoulders. Do you see that in the text? Actually it's, um, you know, it's about the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus will come back, you know, the, the, when he comes back, Jesus will not come back as a child. Jesus will not come to die. When Jesus comes back, Jesus will come back as a ruler to reign. But I think that the reign of Jesus has to start in those of our lives who have accepted Jesus as our Lord, as our Master, as our Savior. So the three pictures of Jesus, to my left, 
to my right and right in front of me. Do you see those three pictures of Jesus? You know, someone has put those three very beautifully with three C's. The crib, the cross, and the crown. Three pictures of Jesus' life. The crib, the cross, and the crown. The crib, for to us a child is born. That's the first one, right? The crib, for to us a child is born. It talks about Jesus' relation to us humans. Jesus took on flesh. He became a human being just like us so that he could identify completely with us as a human. Go through all that we as humans go through. Just the only difference is he did not sin. That's Jesus and his relationship to us, the crib. Secondly, the cross. To us a son is given. The cross. To us a son is given. That reveals Jesus' relation to God. This is Jesus' relation to us. That is Jesus' relation to God. To us a son is given. Now notice this. The son is not born. Did you see that in the text? A child is born. The son is not born. Okay? God does not have a wife with whom he had a son. Jesus was not created as a son. Jesus was, is and always will be God. 100% God. Now when John says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten is from the, word, from the Greek monogenes, which basically means unique in kind. Unique in kind. Jesus is God's one and only son. In relation to God, he shares the same divine nature of God. That is what it means. So the cross, to us a son is given. That is the relation to God. Thirdly, the crown. And the government shall be on his shoulders. As I told you, the first time Jesus came into the world as a child, the second time when he comes, he will come as a conqueror, as a ruler. And he'll come back as a king with a crown. Now Isaiah, he gives us this picture of Christ in this one verse. In this one very powerful verse. So as we celebrate Christmas this year, let's, all, let's not just remain here with the baby in the manger. But let's recognize all these three, all these three pictures of Jesus. And let's worship Jesus in all his power and glory. But Isaiah doesn't stop from here and here and the crown. Isaiah goes ahead. In the second part of that verse 6, Isaiah says, And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah gives four titles of Jesus. And these four titles of Jesus, they reveal his character to us. Both, you know, all these four titles have two words. Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, uh, in this world today, we can get counsel from a lot of people. You know, there, there, is, there are self-help books. There are positive thinking books where we can get counsel from. You know, you... Um, go on YouTube, you can get so many videos that, you know, with pep talks, that'll, you know, you, you'll get counsel from that too. All of these things give us counsel, but they really don't help. There is only one wonderful counselor. There is only one wonderful counselor, Jesus. Last Sunday, 
we heard this wonderful counselor give us the invitation from Matthew chapter 11. Remember what Jesus said? Come to me. Come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus understands our condition. Jesus understands our needs. Jesus understands our context. Jesus understands our hurt, our pain. He understands it all. And he understands it best. He is a wonderful counselor. And if we come to him, he ministers to us and he comforts us with words of wisdom, with words of comfort, with words that strengthen us. So if you are seeking counsel, come to this wonderful counselor this Christmas time. The writer of Hebrews, he tells us that we have a great high priest, Jesus, who is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. He's able to sympathize with us with our weaknesses. Our wonderful counselor, Jesus, understands us completely. And he wants to help us. But will we let him help us? Do we seek his counsel? This Christmas, I hope that we can find Jesus as the wonderful counselor. Isaiah says, he is the mighty God. He is the mighty God. Jesus is not just the wonderful counselor who understands us and counsels us. But Jesus is also the mighty God with the power to help us. He's not just giving us counsel. He has the power to help us. The same Jesus who performed those amazing miracles that we read about in the Gospels is the same mighty God who is there with us. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is the same. He is the Lord God Almighty. And He has the power to save us from our sins. He has the power to cleanse us. He has the power to heal us. He is a mighty God, possessing the power of God. This Christmas, I hope that we will have opportunities in our lives where we will experience Jesus as mighty God. Yes, a babe, but a mighty God. Isaiah continues, he is the everlasting father. Now, when, when Isaiah says Jesus is everlasting father, it's not, he's not talking about um, you know, God the father. Jesus is not God the father. They are three separate persons. That's the trinity. right? One God in three persons. So, the first person, the God the Father, you, we, Jesus, the second person, the Son, is not God the Father. That's not what he's saying over there when he says everlasting Father. But literally, if you see the Hebrew over there, literally Jesus is the Father of eternity. Jesus is the Father of eternity. Jesus is the one who creates time. That's what he means there. Um, when John says in John chapter 1 and verse 3, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made through Jesus. It means that Jesus, as the father of eternity, is the creator of all things. Time, the ages, everything was created through Jesus. And Paul adds to that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created by him and for him. That is who our Jesus is. He is the everlasting Father. He is the father of eternity. He's the one who created time. In fact, if you remember um, the prophecy that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, 
is a prophecy from Micah. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Let me read that to you. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. This is what Micah prophecies over there. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. That's who Jesus is. He is everlasting Father, the Father of eternity. Now, uh, you know, if you want to contrast that, um, who is the father of lies? Who is the father of lies? Satan, right? He is the father of lies. And if you want anything eternal, we have to get it from Jesus. Because he is the eternal father. Okay? He is the father of eternity. That's how Wearsby explains that to us. But um, Isaiah continues, he says, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. When Jesus was born, the angels, they praised, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. God's peace is not a reward for those who do good things. It is a gracious gift of God on whom God's favor rests. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace to bring the real peace to fill our hearts and minds of those who seek him. That is what John 14, 27 says. Jesus says over there, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world does uh, I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I, I pray that as we celebrate Christmas, we would also recognize and experience Jesus as the Prince of Peace. There is a lot of you know, turmoil in the world today. There is a lot of turmoil maybe in our lives today. Allow the Prince of Peace to give you His lasting true peace. Open your lives to Him. So Jesus, uh, Isaiah did not know Jesus. This is about 700 to 800 years before Jesus that Isaiah is prophesying. Isaiah did not know Jesus. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he could write such beautiful things about Jesus. He is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We know so much about Jesus. But have we experienced Jesus in this way? Have we experienced Jesus as a wonderful counselor, as a mighty God, as an everlasting Father, as a Prince of Peace? Have we experienced Jesus? Have we understood the crib, the cross, the crown? So how seriously are we going to take Jesus and His name this Christmas? How seriously will we take it? Do we recognize who the child born at Christmas really is? The child who is born. Do we recognize who the child truly is? Do we realize that the son has been given for us to save you, to save me from our sins? And do we remember, even at Christmas, that Jesus is going to come back again? as a ruler, to judge. Now, as we know about all of this, the question is, what will we do about it? We know the names of Jesus now, the titles of Jesus now. What will we do about it? Let's close our eyes and let's bow down our heads.
Have we experienced Jesus as a wonderful counselor, as a mighty God, as everlasting Father and as Prince of Peace? Or do we just see Jesus in the manger? Have we opened our lives for this child who was born, for the son who was given to be born in our lives? Is Jesus ruling in our hearts, in our lives today? As we've learned so much about Jesus and his character from his titles, let's say a prayer, opening our hearts to Jesus to be born afresh in our lives. Let's say a prayer in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for an opportunity to learn more about you, to learn more about your character. And we thank you for the beautiful way in which Isaiah describes the life of Jesus. We thank you that, Lord, you've given us the opportunity to see the crib. You've given us, Lord, the opportunity to see the cross. But, Lord, you give us the opportunity also to, to live out a picture of Christ, of him as the ruler in our own lives. Help us, O oh God, to display that picture each day of our lives. Lord, help us not just to see Jesus as a tiny baby during Christmas, but help us to delve and to try and understand these titles of Jesus that are so beautiful. And help us, O oh Lord, to be able to understand and apply this, them to our lives. We, we give ourselves into your hands, O oh Master. Teach us and help us to truly worship this, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this father of eternity and the prince of peace. We commit ourselves to you again. Bless us. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. See the benediction in faith. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. And have a blessed week ahead.